so-called living wills. People will often, you know, talk to me and they'll say, well, I want to do this document that says, that specifies um, the way that I want to be treated if I'm in the hospital. I don't want to be in one of those machines if I'm in a vegetated state. You know, and they kind of talk about these things. Well, advanced directives are not legal in Massachusetts. Um, they were, in, and they have not, they've never been legal. Um, there was an attempt to make them legal, which was opposed by the Catholic Church, among others. That was, that was the, the big opposition. And the idea was that a person really can never really know, look into the future and know what kind of medical condition they might be in and what their medical decisions might be. I mean, the notion was it was just impossible to figure that out. And so instead, the legislature said, well, we're not going to authorize these advanced directives, but what we will authorize is we'll authorize you to allow somebody um, um, to step into your shoes and make the decision for you, which third parties can accept. Um, the key to the, the health care proxy is you want your doctor to be sleeping well, right? Because if, if you're in a bad medical condition and the doctor's trying to decide what to do, and he's getting mixed messages from people. He's not happy because he's really concerned. Now, t typically, doctors still, and they're not supposed to do this, actually. They are not supposed to do this. But doctors typically will still take the word of the spouse regarding what to do. If there's, one, if there's a husband that's really sick, they'll typically take the wife's word regarding what the medical decisions are supposed to be. They could get in trouble for that. That's not actually what they're allowed to do. Um, and that's why even for spouses, you want to have a health care proxy in which you, you know, if, you, if, you, if that's the person you want to have making your medical decisions, you want to say that right in the health care proxy. So you want your doctor to sleep well at night and you want to reduce family fights. I mean, I've seen these, these are some of the saddest family fights. The ones that are, the ones that you kind of just roll your eyes are the ones where the kids are fighting about the money, you know. But, with the, with the ones that are really hard is when ma or dad is in the hospital and not doing well and there's an argument regarding what to do. Oh, we should, you know, we should really let him go. We should really unplug. Oh, dad wouldn't really want that. Oh, we're going to do everything we can to save dad. And there are these various opinions among your kids, all heartfelt, all heartfelt. The problem, though, is if you're the doctor and you hear all these heartfelt decisions, you're not sleeping well at night. Because you're thinking that if you take the advice of one of the kids, you could get sued by one of the other kids on behalf of the parent or as the guardian for the parent at some future time. So what you, and what you want at all times is that, that, it, that immediately, if the doctor needs to make a medical decision, he can turn to somebody or she can turn to somebody and say, so what do I do knowing that there's one person that can give them the correct answer? Next slide. So, uh, some things about healthcare proxies. Some of the, the rules regarding healthcare proxies are actually different from those regarding powers of attorney. A healthcare proxy, uh, um, while it never has to be notarized, has to be witnessed by two people. Uh, and those two people um, can't be, actually this isn't quite true. Um, if they are hospital or nursing home employees, um, they can be witnesses except that in that case they also have to be, be your blood relatives, right? Unless they're your relatives, if they are hospital or nursing home employees, they cannot sign health care proxies. And the idea was, you know, there were a lot of things happened in hospitals, and especially in nursing homes, and people were very concerned about, you know, the nursing home getting named as your health care proxy, or the, you know, the nurse that's in charge that day. So they wanted to avoid that. Um, you can also limit your, your proxy's power. You can, in the healthcare proxy, say, I don't want my proxy making certain kinds of medical decisions. Or alternatively, I do want my proxy to make certain kinds of medical decisions. You have the power to do that. 
I never recommend that you do that. Same reason as with the power of attorney matter, only more so. What you, the last thing that you need, remember now, our goal in life here is we want the doctor to be sleeping well at night. The last thing you need is to have the doctor having to be read this, reading this whole set of instructions that you left regarding how you're going to be taken care of and then listening to the person that you named as the proxy and trying to figure out if your instructions are consistent with what the proxy's instructions are. You don't need that, right? The doctor doesn't need that. And, and you don't, so what you want to do, if there are particular medical decisions that you want um, or, or ways in which you want to be treated, once again, my suggestion is that you deal with that through a separate letter of instructions to your healthcare proxy. Next slide. When does a healthcare proxy take effect? <clears throat> Excuse me. These were a little easier. Um, they don't automatically take effect once you've written a healthcare proxy. You ha haven't automatically given somebody the power to make medical decisions for you. They only take effect when your attending physician decides, quote, the principal lacks the capacity to make or to communicate healthcare decisions. Once your attending physician um, has made that decision, and that decision, by the way, has to be in writing, then the healthcare proxy kicks in. And from then on, uh, until your doctor has reversed that decision, um, the person with the healthcare proxy can be making all of these decisions for you. By the way, um, as, that applies to, that, that, as that applies to nursing homes, this has been very liberally construed. So a lot of times, uh, if you are in a nursing home and your doctor makes this decision, it just becomes this kind of ongoing decision. And whoever you've named as your healthcare proxy from then on is making all decisions for you in the, uh, in the nursing home. But the decision has to be in writing. Next slide. When does it stop? Uh, well, first, not surprisingly, it stops when your doctor feels that you have regained the capacity to make these um, medical decisions. So you get into an accident or you have a stroke and you're in the hospital and you're not doing well. Once you've started recovering, as soon as your doctor has said that you've recovered enough to make these medical decisions, then the healthcare proxy is no longer in force. It doesn't get, it doesn't evaporate. It's still out there so that it's available if your condition changes, but it's no longer in force. The second thing though is, and you should just kind of be aware of this generally, you can revoke your healthcare proxy at any time, no matter how crazy you are. So if you're in the hospital and you know, and something is about to happen and your healthcare proxy is saying, this is really the right thing, you know, and, and you're, if, Technically, if you're disagreeing with the healthcare proxy, that doesn't make any difference because the healthcare proxy is where it goes. But if you just say, I don't want you as my proxy anymore, proxy ends. Now, that seems pretty extreme, I realize, but once again, the legislature was confronted with, so, you know, what's our choice here, right? Because the alternative to that would be to have the person in the hospital say, no, no, don't do it, you know? And, and perhaps be just fine, you know, and have everybody doing things to them that they didn't want. And, and once again, the goal behind the healthcare proxy, like the goal behind so much of what we're talking about, is to keep, to leave people with power over themselves and with power over their own decisions. So a person who has written a healthcare proxy can cancel it at any time. Next slide. Um, how is this different from, uh, or DNRs? We're gonna talk about DNRs and a couple of other things. D DNR stands for do not resuscitate. You know, these do not resuscitate orders that, that, you, that you can sign. Um, DNRs are not um, healthcare proxies. DNR, DNRs are instructions from doctors. Um, the, a, a, a decision to not um, resuscitate you, if you have, if you're, out is a medical decision. And medical decisions by law can only be made by doctors, not by other kinds of people, not by ambulance drivers and the guy that walk in, walked into the door and just found you on the floor, right? Uh, which is why we, oftentimes when we, when we talk to folks about, well, if, if people really want to not be resuscitated in the event that they, that they pass out, um, then what you need is to have a DNR. And by the way, it is, it is the, the Department of Public Health, there was always been a lot of ambiguity about what a DNR was supposed to look like and what exactly what it was supposed to say. The Department of Health is trying to, to standardize that now uh, by having one form that everybody is supposed to be using. But the DNR needs to be signed by your doctor. 
you need, to, you need to authorize your doctor to do it. But the healthcare attendant, the person from the ambulance who's coming through that door and seeing you on the floor, right? They want to see a DNR that's signed by your doctor. And that's why a lot of people um, keep it on the refrigerator or have a bracelet that refers to it, have something that refers to the fact that the, that the person who is your attendant should be looking for this DNR.